This is the Fertility Friday Podcast, episode number 102. Welcome to the 102nd episode of the Fertility Friday Podcast. Thank you for joining me today. I'm Lisa from FertilityFriday.com, and this is your source for information about the fertility awareness method and all things fertility. I get emails every single week from women who've stumbled across the podcast. Maybe they did a search for fertility in iTunes, or maybe one of their friends shared one of the episodes with them. These are women who are looking for answers about what's going on with their fertility and their health. And these are definitely answers that we are not given by our educational system. And the thing is that I get emails like this from women all across the world. So it's obviously a systemic issue, women not having access to the information and knowledge that we need to feel good in our bodies and to really understand that connection between our health and our fertility. And, you know, a common theme among my clients is that they're not necessarily getting these answers and feeling satisfied from their interactions with their doctors. And that brings me to what I actually do. As a holistic reproductive health practitioner, I help women to find out how their health, their fertility, and their menstrual cycles are connected by using the fertility awareness method as a diagnostic tool. I help women to feel 100% confident about using the fertility awareness method as a reliable, non-hormonal method of birth control. And I also teach women to know when and if they're ovulating and how to time sex accurately when they're trying to conceive. But, you know, of course it doesn't end there. Because fertility awareness is so much more than just birth control or trying to get pregnant. It really gives you a window into your health and your fertility and how these things intersect. And I love to help my clients use that knowledge to improve the health of their menstrual cycles naturally. And instead of me just blabbing on and on, here's what one of my clients had to say about our work together. I think you are very, you're a natural at creating a very comfortable environment. Like I do not feel it's like the opposite of talking Well, in a good way, it's like the opposite of talking to like a doctor because it's not this like stiff, like really, you know, robotic kind of answer that you're getting from a textbook. Um, It's obviously there are answers that you're getting that are founded on a lot of great knowledge and research and all that good stuff. You know, it's still really solid information, but it's delivered in such a nice, refreshing way. For more information about my programs and to find out how to work with me, head over to fertilityfriday.com slash work with me, all one word. You can get started today by setting up a free 15 minute consultation with me for more information. So head over to fertilityfriday.com slash work with me. Before we delve into today's interview, I'd like to take a moment to thank my sponsor. Today's episode is sponsored by Circle and Bloom. As my longtime listeners know, I have spent a great deal of time on the podcast talking about the practical ways of managing stress. Stress is a topic that comes up consistently in my sessions with clients, and most women that I work with are really surprised by how significantly stress can impact their menstrual cycle in a negative way. In episode number 93, I interviewed Joanne Verkylin, who's the CEO and founder of Circle and Bloom. And in that episode, we talked about the science-based benefits of visualization for stress reduction. Now, Circle and Bloom has developed programs specifically for women who are trying to conceive. Although there's so much that women can do to improve their fertility naturally, many women still do need the support of assisted reproductive technologies like IVF and IUI in order to conceive. And in the same way that the Natural Cycle Fertility Program that I've talked about on previous episodes takes women through a 28-day menstrual cycle, the IVF and IUI Mind Body Program takes you through 18 unique sessions that correspond with the medical IVF cycle. And as a special gift to Fertility Friday podcast listeners, Circle and Bloom has offered a 20% discount when you purchase one of their programs. So go to circlebloom.com slash fertility Friday and make sure to use the discount code fertility Friday, one word at checkout. So again, that's circlebloom.com slash fertility Friday and make sure to use the discount code fertility Friday at checkout. So before I get into today's episode, I wanted to actually record a little preamble, which I don't typically do. I don't think I've ever done this before. But in today's episode, we actually talk about some really, really serious and difficult topics. And so you'll notice the title of the episode, the first word is abortion. And so today's episode is about abortion, menstrual extraction, miscarriage, pregnancy loss, and stillbirth. And Molly and I have a really real, open, honest, raw conversation about these topics. 
And so I wanted to record a preamble just to let you know, to kind of put a trigger warning at the front of this episode. This episode, if you have experienced a miscarriage, if you ever have had an abortion, if abortion is a topic that you're not particularly fond of talking about, this episode really delves into these topics. I'm really, really happy with the conversation that Molly and I had. I feel like this is the only episode where I was really moved to tears. Molly shares some of her own experiences. I share some of mine. And so it's a really powerful episode. And, you know, we really strive to create a safe place where we could actually talk about these difficult topics in a very open and honest way, where I don't find that this is something that is talked about really anywhere. And I'm not really sure where women can go to have candid conversations like this. Often we can't even have conversations this open and honest with our friends and our family. And so I just wanted to preface the episode uh, with this so that you know that this is what we're talking about and so that you're not surprised to find that we really delve into these topics in a really open, honest, straightforward, and raw, um, real kind of way. So with that in mind, we'll get to the episode. And today I'm very excited to welcome my guest, Molly Dutton Kenny, to the show. Molly is an American home birth midwife, a reproductive health advocate and educator who specializes in supporting pregnancy loss and abortion. She works with a full spectrum of reproductive experiences and supports individuals and families in finding the best options for themselves, including traditional home and plant-based alternatives. She teaches workshops on a variety of subjects within alternative reproductive health care, and she's taught hundreds of people the art and science of alternative fertility management, honoring its roots and exploring its potential to change the way that we relate to our bodies, our fertility, and our bleeding. And she also loves catching babies and supporting birthing and postpartum families. I love that midwives always say that they're catching babies. I love that. Mm -hmm. (laughs) (laughs) And in today's show, we'll be talking about miscarriage and pregnancy loss and the role of midwifery care in helping women to manage this devastating life event. So without further ado, welcome to the show, Molly. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me. Well, thanks so much for being here. I was just saying in our pre-chat that, you know, a lot of the work that you do are things that we don't really talk a lot about in our culture. And so I'd love to hear how you, you know, found yourself in the work that you do and what inspired you to become a midwife. Sure. You know, it's funny. I was just having this conversation recently with my mother about how I usually have this kind of pat answer that I give people when they ask me why I became a midwife, but the answer I give is not the real answer. (laughs) So I'll tell you and your listeners the real answer of why I became a midwife. So the answer I usually give is something along the lines of that my mother had her children at home when I was young. I was born in a hospital, as was my sister. But then about 10 years later, my mom had my two brothers, and she had them at home with a midwife. And that was a very formative experience for me. I was 8 and 10 years old when they were born. I was there for the birth. It was a big deal in our family. So I grew up with the knowledge that home birth and childbearing and caring for yourself at home was totally normal. I grew up with the expectation that that was, of course, how I was going to care for my body and that I would have lots of support and resources to do that, which is unusual. And I'm grateful to have been raised that way. But that didn't make me want to be a midwife. <laughs> I didn't go to college originally for midwifery. I I went to this weird school called Global College, and I did a lot of traveling. And I was very interested in international development and this whole other kind of world, which I'm now very far away from. But at the time, that was my interest. And I uh, got really drawn to this holistic health class that I was taking while living in Costa Rica. And as a part of the class, I wrote an article about fertility awareness that I was super intrigued. I was 18. I'd been on the pill for two years and I hated it and I wanted off. But, you know, I was kind of laughed out of Planned Parenthood when I asked about fertility awareness at age 18. Um, So I taught myself. (laughs) I was very frustrated about that and um, determined to find other alternatives to my body. And sort of in the research of fertility awareness, recognizing that like, well, it's imperfect and I'm bound to screw it up at some point. So what are my other options? So I started looking into herbal Um, morning after pill equivalent and herbal abortion. And it was a world I had never learned about. I had never heard that you could manage your fertility with herbs. I thought that, of course, you had to have pharmaceutical pills 
or surgeries or whatever, but that you couldn't just do it at home. Um, and so this was a real revelation to me. And I wrote a lot about it at the time. I was very young. And I, uh, I sent them all to my mother, all the work I was doing. She was very intrigued. And then that year, shortly after I'd written the paper, my mother fell pregnant and didn't want to be pregnant and so reached out to me um, to ask for some resources. And together we managed a home-based abortion for her. She did eventually end up going into a clinic to get a little bit of assistance, but we had all this confirmation and assurance that in fact we had ended her pregnancy at home. Mm -hmm. Um, And it was a really powerful experience for us. It was a really potent and powerful thing that we could do this ourselves, that we could do this with actually very little knowledge at the time, Um, and that that this was, in fact, quite safe, that this was, in fact, quite accessible, affordable, and at a deeper level, this, like, honoring of what was important and what our values were in reproduction, um, that we felt it was very important to be able to do this at home in the way that she had had her babies at home. And so I first came to midwifery through abortion. I was really interested in helping people have better abortions. I found that abortion, as you were saying, is something we don't talk about. And uh, when people have abortions, I find that most of them don't exactly enjoy the experience. It's usually pretty, either it's pretty nothing or it's pretty traumatic for a lot of people. Um, And I found that to be really disturbing that all the girlfriends I had that had ever had an abortion couldn't describe it positively. But my mother could from her home experience, and I found that really interesting. So we spent many years studying and helping other people, my mom and I, and she suggested at some point that I should become a midwife for abortion. (laughs) And I thought that was very funny. But, you know, ha-ha, that is basically what I became. (laughs) So... (laughs) Shortly after that, I did enroll in midwifery school because I was quite intrigued um, by the other end of this spectrum that while I had spent many years studying and helping people not to be pregnant, um, I was starting to have many friends who were choosing to be pregnant and wanting to have their babies in different ways. And I felt really drawn to midwifery as well. Mm -hmm. Um, So I did go to midwifery school for a couple of years. I studied in a couple cities and a couple of countries about traditional midwifery and I'm now a CPM, a certified professional midwife in the United States, which means that I'm certified to attend out of hospital births only, um, which is where my true passion lies in home birth and home management. And sort of through all this, I have obviously, as I'm explaining, uh, really focused on supporting people through loss. So while I do catch babies and love catching babies, and that is a primary act of what most midwives do, a huge part of what I do is supporting people through loss because I find that a lot of midwives don't have those skills. It's not a sufficient part of our education at all. So spontaneous losses, chosen losses, um, whatever people are experiencing, that's really my specialty. And uh, that's what I like to work with. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that even for myself, the scope of what you do, I would never have really thought about a midwife as being able to support a woman if she chose to terminate a pregnancy. And mm-hmm. and I think that topic is really a difficult one, especially for, you know, this podcast, because a lot of women who are listening are trying to get pregnant, actively trying. And I think it's, you know, it's important to kind of take into consideration when talking about topics like this, that there's different seasons in our lives as women. So there's seasons when you do anything to get pregnant because that's the season that you're in. But there's other seasons in our lives when a pregnancy is just not ideal at that time. And I think, yeah, and I think it's such a difficult subject. I I don't think that there's any real space to talk about that. If a woman chooses to have an abortion the feelings that she feels around it are so, you know, conflicted and complex and come up than if a woman has had an abortion and then she's, you know, in a different season of her life now and she's trying to have a baby. And, you know, we never talk about that, the complexities, the emotions that come up once you kind of, if you've been through that. Absolutely. And I find a lot of the clients who seek me out to work with them prenatally and for their birth have had a history of abortions and losses, and they sought me out as a midwife because they knew I could deal with that. Because it will come up in your future reproduction, right? Like, as you're saying, that these are different seasons in your life. I find when women are really struggling 
with conceiving a baby that they want to have at this time, if they have had losses in the past, that circles back around for a lot of the sort of heart work that needs to be done for conception and vice versa. You know, I think that uh, how we experience every phase of our reproduction is affected by all the others. And to me, that has made it really important to be really vocal about my experience and expertise in dealing with loss because so many people who are pregnant and birthing babies or trying to be pregnant and birthing babies have experienced loss in the past. And if they know that they can talk to their midwife about that, that means a lot to them. Mm -hmm. Well, and you mentioned as well, part of what drew you into midwifery in the first place was learning that there were herbs that you could do that would end a pregnancy or bring on menstruation. And so although a lot of women don't talk about these things (laughs) um, openly, Uh, you know, I think that there's some degree of knowing that there are certain things. I mean, you just have to do a Google search and then you get all this conflicting information about, you know, what herbs to take to terminate a pregnancy or bring on your period. And so did you want to touch a little bit on that? I know it's not the topic of the day, but I, you know, whenever this topic comes up, I always have a couple different feelings about it. You know, one of them is it sounds so natural to be able to find an herb that can um, kind of naturally bring on your period if you're not trying to get pregnant. And you're concerned. Um, But then the other part of it is that if you are experimenting with herbs for that reason, and you don't know what you're doing, then there's a lot of risks involved. Uh, So maybe you could just touch on that a little bit. I know you could do a whole weekend workshop on that. So it's hard to to touch on it. I could and I have. (laughs) Yes. Um, Sure. I'm happy to touch on it. Same. Anytime I mention it, people are always like, hold up, stop right there. Explain this more. So, <laughs> so absolutely, uh, there are many ways that people can bring on their period when they want to make sure that it comes. Maybe they were risking pregnancy and they don't want to be pregnant at that time or for a variety of other reasons, people may want to bleed. And there are many ways to instigate that and herbs are one of them. Herbs have always been one of them. Uh, herbs have promoted menstruation since humans have existed. That's how we have often related with our health. Herbs have been used to enhance fertility, reduce fertility, etc. for a long, long time. There are plenty of herbs that are still used that way today. They sort of fall into a, a certain amount of categories. There's herbs that are called amenagog herbs, and those herbs bring on menstruation, which isn't necessarily to say that they induce abortion. Most amenagog herbs are not necessarily strong enough to induce abortion if a pregnancy is already established in the body, but they may be strong enough to disrupt a brand new implantation. Or and most people don't know if there's implantation or not. They just want to be very sure that their period comes. <laughs> so they take these herbs, these amenagog herbs, and they may work that way. There is another class of herbs called abortifacient herbs, which are effective at essentially altering your hormonal state so that a pregnancy is not viable. So perhaps you are early in a pregnancy and deciding that you'd prefer not to be pregnant at this time. There are certain herbs that can mess with your levels of estrogen and progesterone to make continued development of an embryo not possible. Um, And when that happens, your body will eventually naturally miscarry because it can no longer sustain the embryo. They sometimes take a while to work and they can be dangerous. I caution against saying that they are universally dangerous because that is not my experience. My experience is that when people have good information and solid support, they can be very safe. But as you're saying, lots of people these days find information on the internet, um, which has varying levels of accuracy and (laughs) varying levels of safety. And so there have been some unfortunate cases of people using herbs in this way and harming their body. So yeah, my my suggestion to people if they're interested in this is to do some good research and find someone who has some experience to talk to about it. But yeah, I think it is important to sort of destigmatize this and have people understand that it is absolutely an option uh, under certain circumstances, you know. Well, and, you know, I recently did an interview with Kelsey Knight and Emily Varnum of The Fifth Vital Sign. And sure. have you? do you know, are you familiar with them at all or not so much? I've heard of the project, but I don't know much of the specifics. Um, well, basically what they did was they went across 
the States. <laughs> so they went on a three month journey and they traveled all across the States. And I was asking them, you know, a bunch of questions about their experience and what it was like. And the purpose of their journey was to educate about reproductive health and um, menstrual cycle health and those types of things. One of the things that really struck me that they talked about was that in visiting all these different states, one of the things that surprised them is they kind of learned about access to things like abortion and to proper, you know, medical care. And there were some mm-hmm. states where there would be literally like one clinic in the whole state yeah. where mm-hmm. a woman could access a- an abortion if, if she, you know, chose to have one. And I mean, it's such a political topic. I mean, there's listeners who are, you know, completely against abortion. There are listeners that are pro-choice, if however you want to word it for yourself. I stand on the line that whatever a woman chooses, you can't tell a woman what's best for her. But then the question comes, if you make that choice, like it's it's lovely, but if you don't have access to a place where you can have a safe (laughs) abortion, it's like, that's a lovely thing to say we have choice. But really, do you? Do you have a choice if there's only one clinic in the state and it's like so far from where you live? Yeah, and so then a lot of people feel very cornered when they have to make that decision. Well, and so then the implications of being able to have an understanding of herbal abortions or to have access to somebody who could, you know, support you through it. I mean, if that was an option for women, that could really make a profound difference. Yeah, well, it is an option for women. And I think a lot of people don't realize that and don't know it. Um, But there are excellent people who have really good knowledge around this all across the country. Understandably, because the United States is um, a particularly volatile place to discuss abortion, Mm -hmm. Um, I think uh, almost every country in the whole world has laws about abortion and discussions about abortion, but nowhere quite like the United States. It's very, very volatile there. As a result of that, people who work with herbal abortion or menstrual extraction or some other forms of home-based fertility management are necessarily quite secretive about the work that they do because we function in this sort of legal gray area that the legality around abortion is so fluid and confusing in a lot of places that uh, people don't feel very comfortable being upfront about the knowledge that they have to help people in their communities, which is a shame because then when people need that help, they don't know that they maybe could get it in their community. Mm -hmm. (laughs) They don't have to travel to another state or many, many hours away to get a clinical abortion that, in fact, there might be other options, safe options by trained providers quite near to them. So Um, then for a woman who's listening who might know somebody who is in a situation or if they are themselves kind of looking for options and feeling like there are none. What suggestions would you have for them? I mean, where, I mean, they could go to your website, but what suggestions do you have for, for finding support, someone who could actually support them through that? Well, it can sometimes be a bit tricky, certainly. And sometimes you feel like you don't know what words to use to ask someone. I find that in most communities, a good place to start is with the doulas and midwives in your community. Many doulas and midwives do not believe in abortion. Many doulas and midwives have had abortions themselves. Uh, We have a whole spectrum and range of that. Um, However, doulas and midwives know a lot of people about um, who's working with reproduction in the area. You might be surprised that many doulas and midwives might have this knowledge themselves and be willing to work with you, or they might know who will. Particularly, there's a movement for what's called a full-spectrum doula in the United States, which is sort of a catch-all term to mean that it's a doula who very specifically works with loss and abortion as well. Um, So if you're lucky enough to live in a state that has a full-spectrum doula organization, they might be a good place to start asking. Uh, And you could always contact other organizations out of state as well. They may may know people, even uh, sort of a regional network of what's going on. Yeah. That's a good place to start. You can talk to herbalists. I've talked to a lot of herbalists. I have found that this is absolutely not a part of education for herbalists in the United States. It seems to be a very frowned upon part of herbalism um, that very few herbalists are willing to talk about. Very few herbalists have any education or training in, which is really unfortunate because that's who I would like to say you should talk to. (laughs) But unfortunately, Mm -hmm. I find that the herbalists I know know far less than the midwives I know. And I find that really um, kind of distressing, but it's it's the current reality. So you can try talking to an herbalist, but you may have more 
luck talking to a reproductive health specialist, like a doula or a midwife. Mm -hmm. If you think about it logically, it's kind of, um, it's just so sad that even in this day and age, it's still so undercover. It's still so behind the Mm -hmm. curtain. And that just all that that does is isolates women who really need help. And then when yeah. you see the fallout of a woman who did did need help and support and wasn't able to find it, you see the fallout in a lot of different ways. They kind of blame the woman, vilify her, depending on right. the situation. And, and that's just tragic. And I live in Canada. And so in Canada, I, I mean, the, the laws are such that you can access an abortion and you can access medication, but it depends on where you live how close you are to a, a place that can actually do it. So I think to some extent, you know, you being in Canada, I kind of, I kind of take it for granted. And I think a lot of women just, they kind of know that it's there, it's an option, it's available. Like you can go to your doctor, you might have a, you know, a problem if your particular doctor won't prescribe something, but you can still get it, right? Yeah. Even if your doctor isn't going to prescribe it, you could still go to a different doctor. So um, I think sometimes it's easy to forget that, there's women who just absolutely don't have that same level of access. And so uh, it's important to bring these topics to light, just to acknowledge that it's, it's, and it's also not something we can take for granted because every now and then it comes back in the media every now and then a new party comes into power and puts it on the table again and kind of reminding us that they could take the right away. So. And one of the biggest, so I also currently live in Canada, and one of the biggest, uh, but I am American, and I was raised in the States, and I've lived there until very recently. And uh, one of the biggest differences in abortion access between Canada and America is uh, finances. <laughs> we have we have relatively similar issues with geographic disparities and things like that, but in Canada, for the most part, abortion is covered. It's free to Canadian citizens, um, as well as Canadian permanent residents and refugees. Um, Not everybody is served by that, but the vast majority of people living in Canada could access abortion care for free. That's not the case at all in the United States. It's very rare that someone can access an abortion for free in the United States. Um, And as a result, a big reason why some people seek alternative abortion care is because they can't afford a clinic. That is flat out a huge reason why people are seeking this care in the United States. And I think that that's something that we really need to take a look at. Yeah. Well, I mean, I don't want to bash the U.S. too much on the podcast, but there's a lot of areas <laughs> that really do need looking at in the States. I know I've I've gone on my little ranty about the lack of maternity leave like that. I, I can't deal with that. I, I don't understand what's going on. So there's a lot of uh, support that women need that needs to be improved on. And I don't know when that's going to happen, but I, I just can't, I can't even, I, as a Canadian citizen who knows that, um, so it's, sta- and I said this on the podcast before, but it's standard for a woman who, you know, gets pregnant, has a baby. If she has a job, she is by law paying into what we call employment insurance. So it's not even optional, like you have to pay, it's automatically deducted. And so if you work a certain number of hours in your job and get pregnant, then your employer is required to hold your job. And I mean, there are, it's not like there aren't any issues. It's not like there's never been an employer that kind of tries to get rid of somebody. So that's, that kind of stuff is still there. But uh, legally, you know, your employer is required to hold your job. And also you would be eligible to get your EI payments for a year. Mm-hmm. A year, one year, 12 oh, months. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah, so these states has a long way to go. But um, let's kind of, let's switch gears a little bit. One of the topics that I wanted to ask you about, and it's because it's a topic that I don't have a ton of background in myself, but I wanted to talk to you about men's, menstrual extraction. Because um, mm-hmm. I think it's really interesting and I would love to kind of find out, well, first of all, for the audience members, if you've never heard of it, you know, what is it? And, you know, when would it be used or when would it be indicated for? Yeah. Menstrual extraction is a really interesting topic. As a concept, the idea of extracting menses has existed for a very long time. But how I talk about it is in, is about a specific device and a specific time in history. So, in the late 60s or early 60s, late 60s, 70s, 80s, and sort of this swath of time here around 
the very beginning legalization of abortion, um, there was in the United States, uh, there was a group of women working out of Los Angeles who were working sort of in some medical clinics and some other circumstances, and they were very interested in reclaiming certain aspects of gynecology to not need to have to be done in a clinical setting. So this group got particularly interested in cervical self-exam. So they would get together with their plastic speculums and learn how to look at their own cervixes and each other's cervixes. Um, And through that, they were also learning how to identify infections and how to treat infections at home, how to help people get pregnant, et cetera. They were experimenting with all kinds of things by getting to know their anatomy in a much more intimate way. Through this, they also developed a little device that they call the Dalem. And the Dalem is sort of a homemade gentle suction device that involves a jar and a syringe. But the the big thing that it involves is a cannula. It's like a flexible plastic straw almost that gets inserted through the cervix and into the uterus. And you can apply gentle suction to that and extract the contents of the uterus, which is usually some tissue and some blood. Menstrual extraction is only affected if it's done right around when you're expecting your period to come. And there's a lot of reasons why someone might seek a menstrual extraction. Some of the benefits of it are that it's very gentle. I wouldn't say that it's painless. Some people experience cramping throughout, but it's not excruciatingly painful or anything like that. It can safely be done at home without significant sedation or anything. They have developed protocols around infection control and wearing gloves and all of that. Like, There's a whole other side of this I could go into about how and why this is safe, in my opinion. But essentially, people extract their menses. So say that you were going on your honeymoon and you didn't want to bleed while you were on your honeymoon. Or you were an athlete and you have an important event coming up and you don't want to bleed then. Or you're perimenopausal and your menstruation seems to come really erratically and it's really inconvenient for you. There's a whole host of reasons why someone might want to not bleed selectively. It doesn't get rid of bleeding altogether. It's just for a particular cycle. You will skip bleeding that cycle if you do this procedure at home. It's designed to be done in a group of women who already have some knowledge of your body. And yeah, it usually takes about an hour I find some people say they can do it much faster and I have seen it much slower than that, but about an hour is pretty standard. Yeah, it involves a lot of homemade stuff. It costs about $20 to make a Dellum device and uh, it takes some basic training, but you don't have to be a medical professional to learn how to do this. This is relatively widespread for a, a short period of time, <laughs> right around the legalization of abortion in the United States. Listening to this, you may also put two and two together that it could be used as an early abortion device. It was not necessarily designed that way, but some people do use it that way. And around that, you could also use it to help manage um, bleeding after a miscarriage. I've had people ask if you could use it for bleeding after a birth, and I, I've not yet done that, and I'm not sure how I feel about it yet, <laughs> but that is something in the back of my mind that I'm thinking about. Yeah, so for a little while, it was relatively widespread. It became incorporated into what are now called the Feminist Health Centers of California. There's about six of them up and down the coast, and they all were performing menstrual extractions. This group of women in Los Angeles were touring different feminist groups and teaching them how to do it. So there is this sort of cohort of women who are now in their like 60s, 70s, 80s who uh, were very involved in menstrual extraction when they were young. And then menstrual extraction seems to have sort of fallen out of favor, fallen out of commonality for about a generation. And now I'm starting to hear of sort of a new generation of women picking it back up. So I don't think it ever really disappeared. I think it just kind of diminished a little. And now it's sort of starting to build little by little. So is it possible for someone to do this on themselves? In theory, one could do it on themselves, but only if they were very skilled in it. I think it's not it's not really designed that way. It's designed to be done with help. You have to set a speculum, you have to insert the cannula into your cervix. That whole process could be done by yourself, but is a bit challenging. It's much more helpful when you have someone else's eyes on it. And then the way the device is designed is so that the person who is receiving the menstrual extraction, the person whose menses is being extracted, is the person who pulls back on the syringe and initiates suction in the device. 
And that is an intentional design that is different than aspirations in a clinic, for example. And they designed it that way so that they could reduce liability, (laughs) so Mm -hmm. that you could say that you perform the extraction on yourself, that you are the one who initiates suction. You might have someone help you set a speculum. You might have someone help you insert the cannula. But you are the one who is really um, in control of the strength and speed and timing of the whole thing. So um, for some people, that's a really important distinction, not only for liability, but also for their sort of spiritual connection to this, you know, that that this was something that they were doing for themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because when you're describing it, I'm like trying to picture it in my mind. I'm like, I don't I I, like this is outside of my realm of scope. Like this is outside of my my medical capabilities. But I guess what strikes me as really interesting about it when you say that it, it used to be kind of more common and. I think it's safe to say that most women haven't heard of it. <laughs> yeah, it's probably safe to say that. And I think that before I would I would just wager a guess that before the birth control pill was a thing, then if you had your menstrual cycle coming and you knew that you were bleeding and it was your honeymoon, I mean that's that's it. There's nothing that you can do. You're just going to bleed. But yeah. then with the advent of the pill and you can just in, stop, instead of taking your sugar pills, you could just keep taking it and then your yeah. period just won't come. I would wonder if that is part of the reason that this is just not as widespread as it could have been. I think so. I also think that as an early abortion method, it came out right around the same time, not right, like shortly after the um, misoprostone, the abortion pill in the United States became available. And so that is so much easier and more convenient that I think a lot of people would rather take a pill. So, yes, I think since its invention, we've had lots of sort of innovations in medication that people can use in a variety of different ways. But not everybody is on the pill and not everybody would have a medication abortion. So I think there is still a market of people who particularly would be interested in or needing this service. Because you said that it would only typically work then around the time that you would have been menstruating anyways. Right. Most women who don't chart their menstrual cycles have a general idea of what's happening in their cycle. But to be able to say exactly, you know, this is when my period comes, uh, unless a woman is charting her cycles and she has confirmed her ovulation and she knows how long her post-ovulatory phase typically is, it wouldn't really be that accurate of a measure. So when is it too late to do... You know what I'm saying? Like, um, what if she's actually pregnant? Absolutely. And then it goes... So if if you're actually pregnant, you can continue to do it for a couple of weeks into the pregnancy. It's really only an early method. Um, I I tell people, I caution them that it's effective to about six weeks of pregnancy. Um, so any time within that window is fine if you are pregnant and wanting to perform a menstrual extraction. But if you're not pregnant and you're just not wanting to menstruate that cycle for whatever reason, then yeah, trying to get it sort of the day or two before your period or the first day or two of your period is the ideal time. If you try to do it before that, it it likely just won't work. Okay. So if you're, if you notice that your period is just starting, this is something that you could do. And then absolutely. hmm. Yeah. And then it sort of bypasses menstruation for that time. You extract everything and then you might spot for a day or two, but you won't have the heavy bleeding that you're used to having. Um, I've been sort of experimenting with some different conditions with this lately and sort of trying to figure out where this might be of most use. Um, Of note, interestingly enough, I've been working with a friend who has endometriosis where menstruation is extremely painful for her. Um, And she's tried everything under the sun to try and manage it and really kind of at a loss of what else to do. And So we started doing menstrual extraction and we found that it's extremely effective for her, that the actual extraction is very painful for her because that's how she experiences release and bleeding is with a lot of pain. So the actual extraction is more painful for her than it is for the average person, but it lasts an hour. And so she says, you know, I'd rather have the hour of pain than a week of pain. And we found that when we did it repeatedly over many months of time, she was able to not need it some months that her menstruation would come and it wouldn't be painful. So I'm not exactly sure what's happening there. I think that there is absolutely a hormonal reaction that happens, but the people who developed this were activists. They weren't scientists. 
So, and I'm so grateful for the work that they did, but it has certainly left a lot of unanswered questions if you look at it from a scientific point of view, figuring out what the heck is going on. What happens if you extract all your menses at once instead of bleeding over a week? How does that affect your body? What are the long-term ramifications of that? We don't really know. We have a generation of women who did it a lot and said that they had no problems. No problems conceiving babies, no problems with menopause. Excellent. But it's anecdotal and it's a very small sample size. So it's hard for me to say to someone like, yes, this is how it is and will affect your body. But some people find it to be quite a relief. Well, and as you were kind of describing that process, especially for someone who struggles with endometriosis and extremely painful periods, uh, you know, I've had a number of different guests on the show and I talked to Dr. Rosita Arvigo. And she, Mm -hmm. you know, went through the whole description of Arvigo therapy and how the combination of the actual physical therapy to align the uterus and to, um, to align the, the fallopian tubes and the ligaments, but also to, and that alignment helps then the uterus to fully empty. And then the combination of a vaginal steam to kind of loosen some of the menses that might be dry, might be in there and have a hard time expelling. And how that in of itself can reduce cramping. So it, it just makes me wonder if it has something to do with, in her case, having that kind of forced extraction, helping it to all expel where it maybe naturally yeah. would have had a harder time. So it just made me think of that. Absolutely. No, this is a really fascinating area. And I love talking about things that just you'd never talk about. It's kind of like we're in the red tent today and what happens mm-hmm. in the red tent stays in the red tent. <laughs> mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, one of the other topics that I want to talk about, and I know when um, we were planning our interview, you had kind of asked me if I wanted to talk about both of these things on the same show because they're so different. And now I'm kind of having that that sense um, of, of shifting gears and talking about pregnancy loss. But ultimately, mm-hmm. that was something that I wanted to touch on as well. Um, and I think it's really Great. interesting how you talked about the what a full spectrum doula is and how your work extends into this realm. And this realm Mm -hmm. is something that it's not even easy to talk about. You know, I can feel my own feelings of kind of, you know, my own conflicted feelings and feelings of discomfort talking about these topics. And so it just Mm -hmm. makes it even more necessary for this conversation to be had so that we can kind of expose some of these things. But I wanted to talk to you about miscarriage then and your work as a midwife and how you, you know, I would never really think of having a midwife to support me through miscarriage. I have experienced miscarriage. I had a miscarriage very early on before I was pregnant with my first son. It was about six weeks uh, in. Mm -hmm. And so I think that it's common maybe for women in my situation to kind of minimize, you know, well, you know, it was only six weeks and, you know, blah, blah, blah. Like I think every woman kind of tries to minimize it in, in a, in a way. But it's still traumatic and it's still your experience and it's a a loss of your hopes and dreams and everything that you had in that pregnancy. And so, yeah, maybe you could share your experience around supporting women through miscarriage. Sure. Well, first of all, I'm really sorry for your loss. That's a a really hard thing to experience and I sympathize. Thank you. Um, Yeah, I'm grateful to talk about all of this on your show. I think that it's an important thing that on one hand, they're very different. On one hand, they're very the same. I think it's important that that is part of the stigma of abortion. It's part of the stigma of pregnancy loss. It's part of the unknown of menstrual extraction is that these things are all connected. They are all together and that our reproduction is all of this. And I think that's really good and important to relearn how to incorporate this together. I'm actually very excited to talk about it all at once. So yes, in addition to working with um, abortion and with menstrual extraction and sort of this other realm of people who are not wanting to be pregnant, um, I also am sometimes working with people who very much wanted to be pregnant and are experiencing a spontaneous loss in their body, be that miscarriage or stillbirth or a whole host of other potential losses like ectopic pregnancies and molar pregnancies. There's all kinds of crazy things our bodies do when it comes to making and losing babies. So yeah, as a midwife, that is a big part of what I do. I think it's really common what you said that people don't realize you could see a midwife for a pregnancy loss. The association that most people have with midwifery is healthy babies and healthy birth. And I think that's great. That is a big 
huge part of what we do. Um, but it's not the only thing that we do. Another big thing we do is help people who are losing their pregnancies. Um, midwives are specialists in reproduction, in anatomy, in managing complications. We're really, really good at that. So that really comes in to play when someone is losing a pregnancy as well. I came to this work because I've also had many losses myself. Um, I had an abortion a long time ago. That was part of what drove me into abortion work. Um, and then, mm-hmm. as you were saying, there's different seasons of our lives. I'm now in the season of my life where I'm hoping to have a baby, newly married. I'm very excited about all that. But in that past, I've had three losses as well, early miscarriages. Early as in they're in the first trimester, but in varying weeks and levels. And they've all been very different experiences. And um, going through that in my body has really galvanized this part of me that really believes that this should be a huge part of what midwives are doing because so many people go through miscarriages totally alone. And as you said, tend to diminish them in their memory, in their in their way that they discuss it outward with anyone. Oh, yeah, it was a miscarriage, but it was early, so it's fine. It's not fine for a lot of people. It's really, really hard for a lot of people, even if they were only one week pregnant or two weeks pregnant. You know, it's it can be really devastating. And having a person who really knows how to talk to you and knows how to manage the bleeding, knows how to manage the pain, knows how to level with you about future conception, that is all really important and really lacking for a lot of people, unfortunately. So it has been a huge goal of mine to be vocal about that as a part of my role as a midwife and to train other midwives to learn how to do this better in our communities. Well, and even the word miscarriage, I feel like miscarriage, as as you touched on, it just happens. It happens in isolation. We don't talk about it. And so we don't talk about the literal aspect of it, the pain, the bleeding. And so as someone who had an early miscarriage, um, in my experience, it was basically like the heaviest period ever. Like I I can't Mm -hmm. say that I ever experienced bleeding that heavy in menstruation. And I can also Mm -hmm. say that I've never experienced that much pain. And it was, yeah. and I have really pain, I had really painful periods for years. And so it was mm-hmm. excruciatingly painful. And this is at six weeks. It's actually, right. it was more painful in some ways than my experience of labor until the end, like mm-hmm. until the, the actual birth part of labor. Right. Um, and that was six weeks. So then maybe you could touch on kind of the reality of miscarriage and the experience that women are actually going through. Yeah. Well, one of the really interesting things about miscarriage, much like birth, is that everybody experiences it very differently, which is always, and I think even an individual person experiencing multiple miscarriages might experience them very differently. But there are some really physical things that happen that are never discussed. And so even though it might be in your awareness that one of your friends had a miscarriage one time, she probably never told you what that was really like. Um, And so now if you're going to go through the miscarriage, a lot of people go into it pretty blind. They really have no idea what to expect or what to expect is often I find quite downplayed by their doctors. Um, And so they're, they feel like something might be wrong with them. Take a Tylenol. Yeah. (laughs) Right. And then when they experience this like monumental, huge body transformation, they think like, oh, something's wrong because nobody told me it was this bad. So maybe it's only this bad for me and it's totally no big deal for everybody else. When in reality, I find for most people, miscarriage is a huge event in their life. It's usually bloody. It's usually painful. And there's this compounded grief that goes on top of it in most cases, um, which makes everything so much worse. So (laughs) it's a a really tricky thing. Um, But yeah, to answer your question specifically, most people experience bleeding in miscarriage. That's that's a miscarriage. You're experiencing bleeding. Um, And the bleeding is pretty heavy for most people. And you think, oh, I was only six weeks along. That thing was so, so small inside of me. How on earth could I have this much blood? But for a lot of people, it's a lot of bleeding. And that's not that your womb was holding all that blood. It's that as this event happens, there are, and what was the placental implantation site and et cetera in your body um, has these open blood vessels that will continue to bleed. And it takes your body a little bit of time to work up its clotting factors and get through sort of the event of the miscarriage. And a lot of people experience that with a lot of pain. 
it seems, not always, but it seems to be relatively correlated with how you experience menstruation. So people who have really painful periods tend to have really painful miscarriages. People who don't have very painful periods have pain in their miscarriages, but not a lot, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Um, But everybody's different. And uh, there are definitely exceptions to that rule. And then there's this huge piece of grief that happens through most miscarriages where you're going through this huge thing and you're also losing a baby that you really wanted. And that grief can be really paralyzing and that grief can make everything more painful physically as well as emotionally. Um, And a lot of people go through this sort of bargaining thing of like, I'm going through all this and I don't even get a baby at the end. And that is a really hard thing to reckon with and reconcile with while you're going through this really challenging thing in your body. And so a lot of people, miscarriages are unexpected. Some people have warning that they're going to happen. Like maybe they went to an ultrasound and the doctor said, I'm so sorry to tell you, but there's no heartbeat. You can expect a miscarriage. Sometimes that happens, but more often than not, people experience miscarriages out of the blue that they were driving in their car one day and they just started bleeding or something like that. And so there's also this like huge level of shock that often comes with miscarriage that makes it hard for you to focus on things like taking care of your body because you're still trying to wrap your head around what's happening. Um, And it happens often quite quickly and quite intensely. It's like this big storm that kind of comes through your body. Yeah. And I would say that, that that how you're describing this being like a really, really, really heavy and painful period is a common experience of miscarriage. And it's not the only experience of miscarriage that I've heard described or that I've experienced, which I find really interesting. So I've had two early miscarriages that were like that, that were tons of bleeding, tons of pain, and then it was gone just sort of as quickly as it came. And then uh, this year I had a miscarriage at 10 weeks and um, I had a very, very different experience. It was bizarre. It was sort of like having labor and birth. I, I was one of those where it had been diagnosed on ultrasound. I had gone for an ultrasound and they had said, um, I'm sorry, there's no heartbeat. Uh, and uh, so I had a couple of days to sort of wrap my head around like this is going to happen. It's going to happen at some point. I was offered medication. I was offered a DNC and I said, you know what? No, like I'm just going to go home and see what happens. I feel better being by myself. And, um, and I had rhythmic contractions, much like a birth, um, when it finally did kick in. And then my water broke. That's the only way I can describe it. Like, that's what it was. The amniotic fluid came out of me. Um, It was warm. It was wet. It was sticky. And then a little baby came out of me. And then a little placenta. And then I had a bunch of bleeding. And then it was done. And it was really uh, bizarre, (laughs) really meaningful, and very, very different than the other miscarriages I had had. And I couldn't explain it. I found it really like almost disturbing at the time, but also really powerful. It was a mix of so many things. And I talked to a couple other midwives about what had happened. And they said that they had also seen that they had seen these two kind of different kinds of miscarriages and their theory behind it, which is not substantiated by anything other than our observations is that they think that when there was like placental implantation issues and that's what caused the miscarriage that you get the like hemorrhage bleeding and that when it was like a genetic issue or something like that with the baby, that's when you get the like labor and birth. And I find that really interesting. I find it so interesting that even my own body has experienced miscarriages in very different ways and that when I work with clients, they experience them very differently as well. But there are some overarching themes um, of pain and of uh, emotional grief as well. Thank you so much for sharing your experience of miscarriage. I just, I felt this overwhelming, just wave of emotion as you were describing it. So I feel like I I should sit with that for a second. It was, I think that that's something as well that no one talks about. Um, And I think it's a question that a woman might have if she experiences a miscarriage later on, you know, in the process am I going to have to see the baby? Mm -hmm. Because, um, I mean, that's just such a complex, I can't imagine what that would be like. Uh, I just, I can't imagine what I would feel like. I'm very, I'm so sorry to hear not only that you've had miscarriage, but you've experienced it three times. That's, 
Yeah. That's impossibly difficult. Thanks for saying that. It is really hard and also really common, <laughs> which I think is an, another thing um, that gets so frustrating about it not being talked about. I mean, we know that 20% of known pregnancies will end in miscarriage. So that's one in five pregnancies in anyone's body will end in miscarriage. And that's, I'm sorry, and I always put this caveat of known pregnancies because I also think that there's a lot of people whose periods are like a couple of weeks late and then they just come, right? And so they never really report that as a miscarriage, but it may very well have been a miscarriage in their body. So as far as we know, about one in five pregnancies ends in miscarriage. Only about 1% of people will go on to have repeated and multiple miscarriages. So I'm already in that 1%. I've often wondered where that 1% statistic comes from, though, because I know quite a few other people who are in that 1% as well. Mm -hmm. I feel like maybe it should be a little more than 1%, actually. I would and I think that. that going along with this like secrecy around uh, miscarriage is that people don't report them. You know, So I don't know where these statistics come from. These are all the ones that we get from the World Health Organization and the CDC and all kinds of things like that say that these are the statistics around abortion, that I mean, around miscarriage. But I think that it's actually perhaps quite more common than that. Another really interesting thing that I often bring up about statistics with people is that there was a really good study published a couple of years ago about health disparities among different races. Um, and it was completed in the United States, but its implications may be wider than that. And essentially what they were showing in the United States was that um, non-Hispanic Black women had a twofold increase in risk of miscarriage between 10 and 20 weeks of pregnancy. Interestingly enough, before 10 weeks, there didn't seem to be any difference in loss in different um, racial categories. But in um, between 10 and 20 weeks, so what we would consider a later miscarriage, Black women had a twofold risk over white women in the United States. And I think that that's interesting. And another thing that is not discussed is that this might vary depending on who you are and different uh, aspects of your identity, you know, and some people are at much greater risk than others. Yeah. And I mean, there's so many unanswered questions there. I think for women, it's just so you just don't know, um, especially women who you know, you, you, you get pregnant, you know, once and, and then you don't get like you have a miscarriage the next time and then you get pregnant the next time or you don't get pregnant and you have several miscarriages. And um, there's not a whole lot of information given around like around this topic as to why it's happening and what you can do to prevent it. I mean, I've done a number of podcast episodes where we talked about different topics that contribute to it from autoimmunity to say the MTHFR gene mutation and the implications of all these different things. But ultimately, it just leaves women with so many questions. And one yeah. of the, the kind of complexities of miscarriage that I wanted to talk about, and you touched on it uh, just in your own experience, was that when you have an ultrasound and it's identified that there's no heartbeat, maybe you could talk about that process. You mentioned that you had the option to have a DNC, so to have the doctors mm -hmm. go in and physically remove the pregnancy. Mm -hmm. um, or to allow it to happen naturally. Um, part of the reason that I asked this question is because I, I had never really contemplated this specific question until recently, where I've learned of a number of women's experiences with just that, allowing it to happen naturally. And sometimes it happens quickly, and other times it can take weeks or months. Absolutely. And just the, the implications of quite literally carrying around a baby that's no longer mm -hmm. alive in your body and waiting for it to miscarry on its own. Yeah, it's a really fascinating topic. So uh, within miscarriage, so clinically a miscarriage is called a spontaneous abortion. A lot of people don't call it that because they don't like to associate it with elective termination, which we would colloquially call abortion. So people distinguish them as miscarriage and abortion. But the reason why I'm saying this is because clinically what you're describing where someone is told your pregnancy is no longer viable, but it may continue to be in their body for quite some time before it comes out. That's what we call a missed abortion. And some people call it a missed miscarriage, but clinically we call it a missed abortion. And what that means is that, you know, the baby stopped growing, but our body didn't quite realize that. <laughs> so you sort of hold on to the pregnancy for quite some time. Oftentimes, like for me, when I went in and had an ultrasound, they said, like, your baby passed more than a week ago. and you know, we have no way to predict 
when uh, it will come out. And so I was offered clinically, usually what you're offered is a DNC, as you were saying, it's like a, a removal using instruments of the baby from your uterus. Uh, you could also take medication. Uh, it's actually really frustrating to me that more people aren't offered medication because I think taking medication to induce contractions is much less invasive in the body. And I think a lot of people would choose that if they knew it was an option. So it's very frustrating to me that a lot of clinics don't offer it at all, but it should be offered. And then other than that, you can just wait. And this is a, a really tricky thing that there's not a lot of research out there that says, what's the cutoff? How long can you safely wait? What's healthy for your body, et cetera? Um, and so most doctors and clinicians will just tell you that once a miscarriage is diagnosed, it should be finished. You shouldn't leave it around in your body for a while. But I find that that's not how everybody experiences it. Some people have very good reasons for not wanting to have interventions to take care of it, for wanting it to be done very quickly. Some people want to take their time. Um, I found for me when I was told there is a baby inside of you, yes, look at this beautiful baby on the screen, but it's not alive. I wasn't ready to turn around and say, okay, go ahead and take it out of me. I needed a little bit of time to adjust to that knowledge. And so I said, you know, I'm going to go home. I'm going to manage it myself. And I've had quite a few other friends who feel that way, that they feel kind of rushed or pushed into a management option when they really still need to just come to terms with what happened. And I find that our bodies are intelligent. Our bodies will miscarry. <laughs> they know that they can't support the baby. It will miscarry. But sometimes it takes a long while for our hormones to balance out to a level that will release. The longest I've ever worked with someone is four months. That was a really long one. I was personally, uh, as a clinician, uncomfortable with that. Um, I found that that seemed like a really long time. But she had really good reasons. Hers was a late like it was sort of on that cusp of where you would call it a miscarriage or where you would call it a stillbirth. Um, in the second trimester, the baby was no longer growing. She knew that and she waited and she just had utter faith that the baby was going to come out. And she tried some natural home things, some herbs, some homeopathy, et cetera, to try and get the baby out. Nothing was really working. So she decided just to wait and she waited four months. And the baby came out right around its due date if it had lived. And she she was just really, really sure that that was what was going to happen, that that baby was going to come out on its due date. And that's sort of an extreme case. Most of the people I know will wait a week or two and then either make a decision or then it comes out on its own. And I would be remiss in my duties as a midwife if I didn't caution that there are some things that you are at greater risk for if you continue to carry um, a pregnancy in your body that's not developing. So after about four weeks of it in your body, your risk for this sort of rare blood clotting disorder called DIC um, increases. It doesn't become an absolute risk, but your risk increases if you've been carrying this around for four weeks or more. There's also potential risk of infection if your cervix is open, um, and there is potential risk of hemorrhage and stuff like that later um, if your body is going on to this prolonged experience of miscarriage. But I do think that people need to be aware that it is an option. It is absolutely an option to just wait and see how long you can. If someone waits that long, you talk about the kind of physical implications of that, but what about the emotional implications of carrying around a baby who is not alive in yeah. your body for four months? How do you come out? Like, how does the woman come out on the under, other end of that? And then when it's she hard. delivers the baby, <laughs> she would see the baby, the baby that hasn't been alive for four months. Oftentimes, yeah. So that's the tricky part. And that's why I think most people don't opt for this. A lot of times because they were never told it was an option, but also because people can't fathom just carrying around a dead baby. That's what they call it. They said, you know, I can't, this is my child. My child has passed and I don't want to just be a vessel for carrying that around for a long time. For some people, that emotional space is really challenging. For me, it was challenging when I was told, you know, your baby's not alive. And it was another like three or four days before I miscarried. And it was just four days for me, but that was like, a, it was a rough four days. <laughs> you know, it was this sort of like weird identity crisis of feeling like everywhere I went, I was really conscious of like this being inside of me that was no longer alive and that instead of a vessel for life, I was going to be this vessel for death, this vessel for loss, you know, and that was challenging. It was 
also, for me, very, very meaningful. It was the last few days that I had to connect with my baby. It was the last few days that I could really comprehend this gift that I was going to try and give this baby, which was a natural birth. That's what I would have wanted if it had grown. And that's what I wanted to give it now. You know, I said, I didn't want your last experience in my body to be with instruments or with medication coursing through us. Like, I, I want to give you this ability to pass when you're ready to pass. And so for me, it was this conversation between me and the baby and me saying, you know, as your mother, this is what I can give you. And I don't say that to pass any judgment on people who, when they're given that information, simply cannot handle that and need to have the baby out of them, need to have the miscarriage finished. I've had friends who have made that decision and I have wholeheartedly supported them through that as well. And I can see the value in that, that our mental state is really important. And if you can't walk around for a long time holding a baby that way, that is fine and that is normal. And you should, you have lots of options to get it out of you. But there are some people out there who don't want to feel rushed in the process. Um, And so I, I want them to know that it is possible to wait with proper precautions, with proper monitoring, et cetera. It is totally possible to wait and see when it will come out on its own. Mm -hmm. Well, and, you know, as we get towards the end of our interview today, you know, one of the last topics that I wanted to talk about is what I feel like is the hardest. And that's, that's that's just me being human. It's not the hardest. I I always, I feel like I'm intervening in my, on myself. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Because we touched on this as well. You know, every woman's experience is unique. And I, you know, you can't say one woman's experience is worse than another because she had this experience or that experience. But I think it it terrifies me, the thought of, you know, carrying a baby for eight months in pregnancy and then going into early labor and, and having stillbirth. So I feel that mm-hmm. um, stillbirth is, it, it's hard just to fathom as someone who's never gone through that. I have <laughs> friends who work in different professions. One of my friends is, you know, a labor, a delivery nurse. And so she has seen things, you know, and sometimes we talk about that. And it's just so hard to imagine some of the things that she's seen. And, but it's, it is a part of life. And so for women who have had that experience and have not had a place uh, where they can actually talk about it, I would just love for you to talk a little bit about stillbirth, your experience of it, and how you support women who are either going through it or have gone through it it before. Yeah. Stillbirth is really hard. And I agree that I don't like to classify to some people's grief as greater or less than anyone else's. But stillbirth is a particular, really challenging, really painful thing for a lot of people. It's experienced uh, extremely intensely by the parents, but it is also experienced by anybody who is supporting and attending them. As a midwife, I have attended um, about six stillbirths for a variety of different reasons. and They have all really stuck with me where I have attended, you know, hundreds and hundreds of live births. So a lot of them just sort of blur together in my brain. I remember every detail of all the stillbirths I've attended. It's a particularly horrible thing to experience um, of anyone involved. There's a huge amount of grief that goes along with that. It's unmistakably, unimaginably filled with grief for however anyone here has experienced a miscarriage. As you're saying, now imagine that you had carried that baby for nine months and you are on the cusp of birth and um, are told that your baby's not going to live. That's a really, really hard thing. As a midwife, part of what I do with people, um, what I'm always doing with people is counseling them on their options and making sure they know the full range of things that they can do. There are people who opt to have their stillborn babies at home, particularly if they had been planning a home birth. They might still plan a home birth. Most of the miscarriages I've attended have not been in a hospital. Some people do have their stillborn babies in hospital and So for me, a big part of what I'm doing is counseling on what are all your options and what are the implications of all of those options for you, for your family, for the baby. And then a big part of what I do is this sort of logistical organizing around it. So most people, when they have a live baby, never really see the back end of like how we fill out your birth certificate and all that kind of stuff. But when you're attending a stillbirth, there's actually quite a bit that needs to be done in terms of contacting a funeral agency and 
figuring out how to work with the body and how to get a death certificate. It's much more involved than a live birth. And so as a midwife, I take care of all of that so that the family doesn't have to work with any of those logistics while it's happening. And then a huge part of what I'm doing is validating and holding space for this awful, awful thing that happened. So a midwife colleague of mine says that when she attends stillbirth, she sees the family every day, postpartum, every single day. And she's like, that's that's what you need. That's the level of care you should be getting. You should be seeing someone who can ask you how you're doing, who can offer you different support and care for your body every single day for six weeks. That's what she offers. And I think that that's really beautiful. It's a huge amount of time as a midwife, but it also helps us process what just happened here. There's a whole other discussion about midwifery and liability and all the other stuff that goes on with stillbirth. But in terms of supporting a family, a lot of what it is is just showing up. Because it, just like all the other things we talked about, stillbirth is another super silent thing in our culture that people talk about it in whispers. And when it happens, we either pretend like it didn't happen or we just don't know what to say, so we don't say anything. And that is really... A lot of clients I've worked with have said that that is the most painful thing. Even more painful than losing their baby was the fact that nobody talked about it at all. And that that felt like nobody even acknowledged that their baby ever existed. And that sort of erasure of this huge experience in their life was the worst. So as a midwife and what I counsel anybody who knows anybody who's going through this, it's like as hard as it is for you best thing you can do is just show up, just ask if their baby had a name, call the baby by the name, talk about their baby. Like They're still thinking about their baby. They'll be thinking about their baby forever. So if they know you are too, that means a lot to people who are going through this kind of grief. Well, and it just reminds me of something that I heard, and I think I've mentioned it before on the podcast around miscarriage, but for all that we don't really talk about it and I think that it's surprising. It was surprising to me. And I think it's surprising to a lot of women to find out that how many of your friends have had a miscarriage and you typically only find out when you have one. And all of a sudden it comes out of the woodwork and people start sharing their own experience of miscarriage that you just did not know they even had. Mm -hmm. But so for all the kind of minimization that we often do and just kind of not talk about it and, you know, act like (laughs) it never happened. If you were to ask any woman who's experienced a miscarriage, she could tell you, you know, how old the baby would have been. I know. Mm -hmm. So it it doesn't go away. No, most people will make that calculation every now and then for the rest of their life. Right. Like I know exactly how old all my children would have been. And I think most people who have lost babies do as well. Mm -hmm. Well, powerful discussion that we had today, Molly. I've been on the verge of tears several times (laughs) in our conversation today, and that's not typical of my interviews. So I know that it means that our conversation was really important, and I really hope Mm -hmm. that it helps a lot of the women who've listened. And so given our discussion today, you know, what would you want for the listeners to take away from what we've talked about today? I think it's really important to understand that our reproduction functions on this vast spectrum and that, as you eloquently put, we go through very many seasons in our lives and sometimes we go through them very quickly. (laughs) Sometimes we want to have babies, sometimes we don't uh, want to have babies, sometimes babies are born and sometimes they're not born. And that is all a cycle and all a big part of what we're doing. I'd also like people to take away that they can and should be supported through all of those experiences, that these experiences don't have to be secret. They don't have to be unspoken. You can have a midwife support you through all of this. You can have a doula. You can have a good girlfriend support you through all of this. And you should, and you deserve that. And I would also advocate that these things should be talked about together. And that I'm grateful that that we did that, that I think uh, it's important to understand that this spectrum exists within each of us, that many of us will have all of these experiences in a lifetime and that compartmentalizing them and separating them out does more harm than good for us. And uh, it's important that we embrace all the possibilities as unfortunately normal, as worthy of care, worthy of support and worthy of discussion. Do you feel that there are any myths about miscarriage that you would want to rectify if you could? Yeah, (laughs) many. Uh, One, of course, that people think it doesn't happen that often. Miscarriage happens all the time. Um, And I would want people to know that, that it's common, it's normal, and you will get through it. 
But beyond that, a big part of what I do as a midwife is reminding people that they have options in miscarriage, that you can manage a miscarriage with herbs, you can manage a miscarriage with menstrual extract, you can manage a miscarriage with just simply waiting. You aren't beholden to the very few options that you are given in a clinic, just like birth. You can choose all kinds of things when you're going to have a live baby, and that still applies when your baby's not going to live. You also have lots of options then. And I think that a lot of people aren't aware of that and would really appreciate more holistic management, more holistic options around their miscarriage so that they could relate with it in a way that feels best to them. As you say that, I just think about that. You know, a lot of women try to make all these healthy, natural choices and then to be faced with uh, a miscarriage and be being kind of forced to make choices that just don't feel good um, exactly. for them. Mm-hmm. Um, and final question of the day. You know, what advice would you give to someone listening, a woman or a couple who is trying to conceive, potentially has experienced miscarriage uh, or several? What advice, if any, do you have? Oh, I feel like a fraud giving advice on that because that's my life right now. (laughs) I'm, I'm trying to conceive and it's challenging for me and I have had lots of losses. So it's complicated. It makes you feel so many feelings. It makes you think about your losses differently. It makes you think, what if those were the only babies I'll ever have? It it makes you reflect on whether or not your body is just broken and is never going to work this way. And there's so much that comes into that. So I'll try and give myself some advice. (laughs) I'll give other people some advice, which is go easy on yourself. (laughs) These things are normal. You will have a long life and you will probably have so many experiences. And I'm sorry that you've had the ones you've had so far, but they do not define the entirety of your reproduction. There's still time for you to have other reproductive experiences as well. I always found it sort of an infuriating cliche when people told me I just needed to de-stress and then I would have a baby so easily. And I was like, yeah, easy for you to say. You know, (laughs) That is very difficult for people who are trying desperately to conceive. So I'm not going to say that, that you should de-stress because that's ridiculous. It's really hard to de-stress. But I will say that if you can find some space in your life for acceptance of the losses that have happened, for reconciliation with that, and some way to love your body through that and not blame or believe that your body is at fault, but some way to honor and love your body even through the losses and even through the struggles with fertility, that even if that doesn't solve your fertility problem, you'll be better off if you can find a way to love yourself anyway. Easier said than done, but it's <laughs> I suggest. Oh, well, those yeah. are wonderful words to end on. Molly, I just want to thank you so much for being on the show today. I I just I can't tell you just how powerful this conversation is. Um and so for the listeners who want to learn more about you and about the work that you do, where can they find you? So I have a website. It's my full name, uh, which is long, Molly Duttonkenny.com. So M O L L Y D is in dog U T T O N K E N N Y dot com. And there I have some writing, some workshops, and professional services for folks who are interested in that. Mm-hmm. And you're doing them live because you currently live in Toronto? I currently live in Toronto, so I can attend people in this area. Some services can be done long distance, and then I also offer long distance workshops for folks who maybe want some professional training and how to help people through these experiences. Mm -hmm. Well, you're in my neck of the woods, so hopefully we'll have a chance to actually meet in person at some point. That'd be really neat. But um, thank you so much for, for being here, Molly. You're very welcome. Thanks for being brave enough to have these topics on your podcast. You're welcome. What a powerful episode today with Molly. I just want to thank Molly again publicly for sharing her own experience just so vulnerably and honestly. This episode was an emotional one for me. It hasn't happened very many times where I'm recording an interview and I actually am moved to tears. And that's just because of just the raw, real stuff that we were talking about in this episode. And so I'm just so thankful that we were able to have an open and honest, real conversation about these really difficult topics. I know for many of you, these are kind of the last things that 
you actually want to talk about, I mean, abortion is a really difficult topic, Uh, miscarriage, loss, pregnancy loss, stillbirth. I mean, these are some of the hardest topics that you can really talk about because of just how devastatingly painful these topics are. But with that said, in my experience, I haven't found that many places where these topics are discussed candidly and openly. And, you know, only with, say, a few of my own friends that we've ever really talked about these topics. And so I have some friends where, you know, I could talk about these topics and go into detail and, you know, really delve into them. But for the most part, when these topics come up, you kind of shy away from them and you don't really get into the meat and the heart of the conversation and the reality of what happens when a woman experiences a miscarriage or what happens when a woman is experiencing an abortion. So I'm really glad that we were able to have this difficult conversation today. And if you enjoyed this episode and you know someone who you think could benefit from hearing it, uh, please do share it with a friend. You'll find the show notes page for today's episode at fertilityfriday.com slash 102. If you've been enjoying the podcast, please do look for it on iTunes and leave a five-star review so that more people can find it. And make sure to head over to fertilityfriday.com and join my email list. If you have an idea for a podcast episode or a guest suggestion, send me an email at info at fertilityfriday.com. And I just want to thank you again for listening, for hanging out with me today, for supporting the show. I really appreciate all of you for taking the time to tune into the podcast and let me be part of your day. Before we end the show today, I'd like to take a moment to thank my sponsor. Today's episode is sponsored by Green Pasture Products. They offer fermented cod liver oil, concentrated butter oil, coconut oil, and a variety of products and blends. One of my favorite products that they offer is fermented cod liver oil, and it's one of the few food-based supplements that I always have in my house. And not only do I take it, but my kids take it too. The fermentation process preserves the natural vitamins A and D, which your body needs to make hormones. And in episode nine of the podcast, I interview Sally fallon Morrell, who is the founder of the Western Price Foundation. And in that episode, she talks in detail about the benefits of vitamins A, D, and K. So make sure to go back and have a listen to that episode and also head over to greenpasture.org for more information about the products. So thanks again. And as always, until next time, be well and happy charting.